Thank you, uh, Tanya. It's a good pleasure to uh, follow you and uh, be able to share some time uh, with all of you uh, this morning. Um, I want to thank uh, our elders for their prayers and uh, for their uh, way of grounding us this morning and uh, thinking about uh, who we are and where we're from. Uh, I woke up quite early this morning because I drove in from Toronto uh, and uh, turned on the television set at uh, 5 o'clock and was watching uh, the funeral service for uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that based on my uh, short experience uh, these uh, few years, uh, Mr. Mandela is probably the greatest person that I've ever had the opportunity to meet uh, and had the opportunity to, uh, to share a little bit of time, uh, time with. And the events of the last few days in South Africa and the uh, outpouring of emotion and the discussions that we've seen on the uh, television and the radio and in all the media really give us an opportunity to reflect on who we are as well. Uh, because when you consider uh, what has happened in world history over the last several hundred years, um, Canada and South Africa actually have a lot in common. Uh, we are, uh, in our, who we are today, we're the product of, uh, of the colonial uh, experience of uh, people, armies uh, coming from uh, Europe uh, to uh, the Americas, uh, to uh, Africa, to Asia, uh, with a common assumption that they had assumption that their way of life was better than anyone else's, it was superior to, to theirs, uh, and uh, an assumption that uh, they had a mission uh, to convert um, whole millions of people to one religion, uh, a mission to, quote, civilize people according to uh, their uh, standards and their perspective and their view, uh, and uh, the history of the Americas, the conquest of Peru, the conquest of Mexico, uh, the conquest of North America, of uh, Canada, the United States, uh, is remarkably similar to the story of the conquest of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, and the only difference really now today between Canada and South Africa is that there are a lot more settlers in Canada than there are of indigenous people. Uh, and in South Africa, there are a lot fewer settlers than there are of indigenous people. And in fact, he'd even go so far as to say this, that in fact, when you look at the system of apartheid, which was eventually created as a way of expressing the superiority of one race over another race, over the civilizing mission that one race had allegedly over another race. Uh, one of the sources of inspiration for apartheid was a piece of Canadian legislation called the Indian Act. The Indian Act was brought in in 1876 after Confederation in 1867. And the Indian Act was based on the premise that uh, Indians were, as they were called, uh, were a group of people who were inferior, that needed to be cared for uh, or put in places. Treaties were signed uh, in which people were basically told you can live here, but you can't live anywhere else. In the early days of the Indian Act, you needed a pass to move out from where you were living, same as the pass system in, in South Africa. Uh, and what Tanya said, I think, is, is very important, and that is to really understand who we are, we have to understand who we've been. And to understand the anger and the frustration that is expressed in Idle No More, you really have to understand where that frustration and that anger comes from. Um, and this is not intended to make everybody feel guilty or everybody feel bad about themselves or sort of, uh, it's not about that at all. It's really about, first of all, understanding the truth of who we are, where we've come from, what our experience has been, and what the experience of other people has been. 
And then how do we reconcile once we've talked about the truth? Once we've dealt with the truth, dealt with the discrimination, dealt with the attempt to basically wipe out a people, uh, first of all physically, and then when that didn't work, say, well, now we have to assimilate everybody, and everybody has to become just like us. And we would, we've spent a long time, residential school experience is based entirely on the notion that you can take, in the words of, of uh, someone, that we can take the Indian out of the child. And that that's how, that's how life is going to be carried on uh, in, uh, in our country. What we've seen in the last uh, 50 years, and if I may say so, Tanya's uh, father uh, was a very active leader in, the, in really the, the, the birth, the rebirth of the awareness, of uh, political awareness uh, that was taking place within the First Nations uh, community. And because of, and use students of social science here, uh, because of the transformation of a generation that was starting to happen, the first generation going to university, uh, political leaders beginning to emerge who were speaking a, a more modern language because of the dynamic of the radicalism that was uh, in place in the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s uh, in Canada and indeed in the United States. People learning more about their history, people becoming aware of who they were as a people, and people no longer accepting the discrimination that, uh, that other generations had, had simply suffered and put up with, resisted in a variety of ways but nevertheless had had, uh, had, had, uh, had to live with. And over the last several decades, we've been going through a process as a country of really trying to understand how do we reconcile what's happened with what needs to happen, and how do we create policy that takes us beyond where we are today. And the Idle No More movement, I think, has to be understood uh, in that context, uh, in, the, in the context of this dramatic change which is underway and which is continuing. So that today, for example, on reserve, the average age of the population is much different than it is outside uh, in the non-Aboriginal population, the non-Indigenous population. Uh, the, uh, the half the population on, on most reserves today is under the age of, of 25. Uh, and uh, we're seeing a youth explosion uh, on reserve, which is uh, uh, exciting, uh, but which in itself is creating uh, a movement uh, of people who are coming themselves into cities and into communities outside the reserve system. So that what, what were places that were sort of out there and different from and separate from uh, are now in here more and more, where in universities and in colleges and uh, in places of work people are encountering um, First Nations indigenous people in ways that they would never have encountered them 50 or 100 years uh, before. So that's the first transformation that's taking place. The second major transformation that's taking place is is not really new, because it's really part of the Canadian story. And that is that with, ex with settlement and exploration and the development of resources, the frontier of the country has continued to move, to move north and west. And as it moves north and west, people are, in the last few hundred years, people have been displaced. They've been killed, partly by conquest and partly by disease. One of the major impacts of, of, of the arrival of colonial settlement on the Americas was massive outbreak of disease that people had no immune systems to cope with. So the population was literally uh, decimated. Uh, and we saw a huge decline in population uh, from the 17th century all the way to the beginning of the 20th century. And now a rise in population, uh, which is a uh, a fascinating phenomenon, and not at all what uh, the founders of our country expected would happen. The expectation in the 19th century was that the Aboriginal First Nations indigenous population would be literally wiped out. It would not exist in 100 years. And that is not what's happened. What's happened is actually the reverse of that. Uh, people are, are in, here in bigger numbers uh, 
and with greater presence than, uh, than ever before. This movement of the frontier, if you like, now means even more that communities that we thought were out there are actually in here because whether it's building a pipeline or whether it's building a mine or extending the boundaries of the forest industry, we're seeing a continual movement north and west of the resource sector in this country, which means that places that nobody thought would be the place of interface between uh, non-Indigenous and Indigenous people are, in fact, just that. Uh, so whether it's Attawapiskat, which is 50 kilometers from a diamond mine, or whether it's the communities of, uh, around the Ring of Fire, which I've, I've been working with over the last few years, whether it's vast mining development in Nunavut, whether it's the uh, natural gas industry spreading further north uh, in, Alps, in Saskatchewan and in Alberta and in British Columbia, and directly affecting the, the territory, the traditional territory of people who've, who've lived uh, beyond uh, the, the resource industry for most of their lives, we're seeing this connection, this interface happening. And the third sort of big change that's happened is the change in the law. For the longest time, the assumption of Canadian law was that, from a legal standpoint, there was nobody here when the Europeans arrived. Legally speaking, the act of conquest was the creation of sovereignty. And there was only one sovereignty, and that was European power. This began to change slowly, first of all, because the British and the French realized that they had to make friends with indigenous people if they were going to survive in this rather hostile climate. And so they signed a number of treaties. And treaties in, in eastern Canada, the treaties in, uh, in Ontario in the early 19th century, uh, and then the num so-called numbered treaties, which uh, were brought into place in northern Ontario and, and in western Canada um, at the very end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And the treaties, basically, by their very nature, by the fact that you say it's a treaty, you're recognizing the other. They're recognizing you, and you're recognizing them. Now, we can all argue about the meaning of the treaties from a legal standpoint, but from a political standpoint, we were really recognizing somebody else had, had a position. And what's happened over the last 35 years, really, since the patriation of the Constitution, is that the courts have been brought into play in interpreting where are we today. And the courts have said, first of all, hey, you know what? There were people here before anybody got here. And there is such a thing as Aboriginal title. And there is such a thing as an indigenous right. And there is such a thing as an inherent right. And what the courts and the law are struggling with is, well, what does that mean exactly? And the latest expression of what it means is, it means that there is a duty to consult and to accommodate. That there's no longer just let, a, let her rip. Ignore anybody else's claims. Let, they've got a problem, let them take you to court, you're going to win anyway. There's now the courts of Canada are saying, hold on here, companies. Hold on here, governments. You have a duty to consult and you have a duty to accommodate those who have a claim to a traditional territory. Now, it's fuzzy because we don't know exactly what that means. But it's clear that there is a duty to consult and to accommodate. And so the question now is being posed to everyone on all sides of the equation, what exactly does that mean? How do we create these new partnerships? How do we give people a stake in the new economy? And so Idle No More is a complex movement. It's a popular phenomenon. 
It's outside the framework of the Indian Act. It's outside the traditional power of the reserve system. It goes beyond the traditional leadership, both in the non-indigenous and in the indigenous population. And it seems to be marking a bit of a wave. And one of the fascinating questions is going to be, how does that non-traditional form of leadership, how does it come to terms with the ongoing institutions which are in existence today? And that's, that's the fascinating challenge which we're, which we're seeing. We're seeing it at work in, uh, in, you know, we see it in demonstrations, you see it in blockades, you see it in, in the expression of, uh, of, of local mo mobilization against a particular project. But you're also seeing it in another way, and that is how First Nations leaders are feeling that they now have to engage, not only with this movement, but also engage with governments and engage with companies and engage with those who are in the process of, of uh, trying to uh, move forward uh, in the field of the economy, whether it's mining or whether it's, it's uh, gas or whatever it may be. And I think Tanya has expressed very clearly the fact that there is a different perspective that looks longer term at sustainability that says, well, how do we make sure these jobs are going to be here over, over generations? How do we make sure that, in fact, the development is going to be sustainable? How do we make sure that uh, the resources in the ground are going to be used uh, in a way that doesn't pollute, that doesn't cause permanent damage? How do we make sure the river systems aren't poisoned? How do we make sure that uh, the, the waste from the development does not overcome uh, the people who are living in the area which is, being, which is being developed? These are all examples of the questions that we need to, we need to explore and need to, need to look at. But it's, what's exciting for me is that here, here you are as a group, your first year in, in, uh, in the Ivy School, third year in university, uh, you're starting out on thinking about what you're going to be doing and how your lives are going to unfold. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in a class 20 or 30 years ago, nobody would have said that the question of where First Nations are, where Aboriginal and Indigenous people are, is going to be a critical area for you to understand, for everyone to understand, as we go forward in looking at uh, how development will take place, how jobs will be created, and how the economy will work. Uh, that might have been true in previous generations. It's not true today. Uh, and so the transformations that we're seeing take place are ones that involve you and your generation. And there'll be lots of questions around leadership, lots of questions around what's required of us to, to go forward. I think the dream is to try to create a country in which, as Tanya said, everybody can simply be themselves. Everybody can see themselves, not only in the constitutional mirror, but in the economic mirror, in the political mirror, so that we're no longer a country that's separate, where people are living apart, or where people are being held down, but we're living in a country where everyone is included. And so to conclude where I started, um, Mandela speaks to us as Canadians. He doesn't just speak to South Africans. He speaks to us as Canadians. Because his dream of, of a rainbow country, his dream of a country that included everyone, and his, his dream of a country that empowered everyone is, is a dream that applies to us as much as it applies to, uh, to his own country. And that's something that we all need to reflect on as we, uh, as we go forward and as we continue our conversation this morning uh, and as you continue your studies uh, into the future. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you today. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.